Hello everyone and welcome to my channel Needed Art History where I'm sitting telling you some art history stories while knitting and well welcome to another video. I skipped a previous week. I just I I just was lazy, I'm not gonna lie. Just was lazy, didn't really want to talk to do anything. But well uh, today we're going to be talking about another part of our Ukrainian uh, art, Ukrainian culture and today I will be presenting you um, like one of our very distinctive features which is very popular in Ukraine and well, not just in Ukraine, just like in the whole world and as you can see by the name of the video we will be talking about Petrikivsky Rospus or Petrikivka painting and uh, well I tried to gather as much information as I could <laughs> from uh, like online. I was preparing also this material for my university class of uh, decorative arts and well, it, it was fine. Uh, but uh, yeah, but just overall there is not a lot of information, uh, I mean in, in terms of books, so I, I won't be able to recommend you anything today. And uh, just, this is, you know, this is like just overall a very big problem for for us here in Ukraine that we don't really have access to literature. Okay, I'm, I, I will stop <laughs> mumbling. Uh, I'm taking my knitting, still continue on this piece. I don't know for how many months it's already, but well, yeah. So, 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 let's dive into our topic today. Petri Kivka painting was first recorded and introduced into culture use in 1913 by the ethnographer uh, Dmitro Yavornitsky. Uh, however, it doesn't mean that uh, it appeared in 1913, it's it just that I, I, I'm saying it was recorded. It was officially like put it as a part of uh, Ukrainian culture and it officially gained interest from researchers um, because we, well, Technically, we don't really know when this um, all of this started and when exactly this um, painting started to appear in like in this style. Uh, so it's and I think we will never actually find out about this because it's a folk art. But in in 1913, in this period of time, uh, 1911, 1913. So um, there were also a young painter, uh, Yevgenia Evenbach. So she was working under the guidance of this Notoria Vrnitsky and she was actually the one who was uh, uh, going around in Dnipropetrovsk region. I, I need to say this, that uh, well, Petrikivska paint, Petrikivsk, yeah, Petrikivsky painting, Petrikiv painting, my god in English, um, is coming from the, the names come from the village. Petrikivka, and it is situated in Dnipropetro region. I will show you the map, obviously. Yeah, so this Yevhenia Evenbach, she was like going around uh, not just in Petrikivka, but just overall in uh, Dnipropetrovsk region and also in Poltava region. And uh, she was collecting and repainting some of the folk uh, art examples, uh, some of these paintings. And um, all of this then in 19... Uh, 13 was presented on a big exhibition in St. Petersburg and this is why uh, this year 1913 is considered to be the year of the first fixation of the Patrykiv painting. This village Patrykivka. It was founded in 1772 by uh, Petro Kalnyshevsky uh, as a result of uh, resettlement of Cossacks. So it was this year also that Zaporizhka siege, so there was like a fortresses we can say of our cossacks uh, uh, the place uh, where they were living and all of this stuff it was liquidated uh, pretty brutally by catherine uh, the empress of uh, empire yeah, another crazy bitch i'm sorry sorry not sorry uh, but yeah and uh, why this village is so you know interesting because uh, it was founded and it uh, you know, um, didn't got under the, the rule of um, slavery. So there were not such thing as um, serfdom. People were, were free here and which obviously led for uh, a very big spike of creativity. It is believed that Patrick Yuka painting started in um, 
started to emerge somewhere here like in the at the end of like the second half of uh, 18th century. In uh, Petrikivka themselves, the villagers, they believe that uh, this style actually appeared thanks to Cossacks, so they were the first one who started to uh, create all of this. But obviously there is legends, so one of them is, um, as I understand, the most popular is that there was such a uh, young uh, girl, Oksana, so she was left uh, home alone on Sunday because uh, uh, her parents went to to the fair and uh, she apparently got bored and she decided to paint uh, the whole house the whole um yeah the whole house i'm sorry uh with different ornaments different patterns uh, when her parents came back obviously they were like distressed very much they you know they were uh surprised in a very negative way they started to bash her that what have, what have you done, you know, you know, stuff like that. But uh, neighbors and villagers, they were actually like blown away and they were actually very uh, fond of this work. And they started to ask this young girl to uh, do the same thing for them. So this is how, you know, it all started. However, as I said, we don't really know for sure uh, who was the first one that started this style and uh, who started to paint like this uh, so yeah so it's is and i to be honest i think that we will never know because you know it's folk art it's very hard to find you know the primary resource how it all started and stuff like this so yeah but there's legend like this and um uh since that time all houses in Patrikivka have been painted with patterns and people are saying that it's beautiful in this village like in church thus it is believed that uh, obviously this um Patrikivka painting uh originates from the paintings uh, of a peasant house uh which is you know overall is like in general it's a very popular it's a common stuff for us ukrainians so it's not just something that was just in Patrykivka or like Dnipro Patrykivsk region uh it's um all like it's popular in a in a lot of regions of ukraine it's part of our culture also and uh, uh overall you know we tried to maintain our houses very clear clean i'm sorry and neat uh, so if, uh, you know, if people didn't have any possibilities to paint them, so some were, you know, some were poor and they needed to work a lot, so they didn't have time to paint this, they I didn't know how to paint and they didn't have money to pay to someone to decorate their house, uh, so they tried at least to paint it just white, so the traditional col color of our houses is white, and uh, People try to maintain this white, you know, so they were repainting them every year, uh, at least once a year. So sometimes it was, well, it was uh, either every spring or twice a year. And so my grandma was also telling that uh, my great grandma, she was always, you know, she was always keeping uh, our house in the village. We don't have it now. Uh, so my grand grandma, she with with her siblings they sold this house like years years ago so i i have even no idea I never i have no idea how this house looks like so yeah so just you know just family stories and she was telling that her mom was always trying to keep it neat she was always you know painting it just white and um and it was painted white not just from uh like uh, outside not just the exterior of the house but interior of the house also was painted white and uh, and as I said, was always we try to keep it all very tidy and neat. But some of the regions, uh, some of the houses were painted with ornaments, also on this white paint. So they were repainting their houses, uh, like as I said, once or twice a year. And sometimes maybe they were painting the same ornaments. Sometimes they were each year you know they were painting different ornaments and changing different ornaments and as i said not just from exterior but in interior also and obviously a lot of them also uh, decorated um, different household items also especially uh with especially chests uh for for the brides home painting in form of in form of wall painting so uh, it existed in Petrykivka at least starting from 1860s, 
uh, from the end of 19th century they started to paint on paper and also it is worth mentioning that in this period of time like in the middle of 19th century uh, there were a lot of people who were coming from uh, Poltava and from Poltava uh, region and also from uh, Slobozhanshchina uh, so Slobozhanshchina is like culture is like ethnical ethnocultural region so it's like part of uh Kharkiv region that is part of this so i will always show you the map you will understand what i'm talking about what which part of ukraine is that uh it's like eastern part of ukraine uh so it is also believed that maybe this petrikivka painting is coming uh actually from these regions because there were a lot of people who uh like moved from this uh, moved to petrikivka uh from other, from Poltava and uh, Poltava region directly and Tobozhanshin overall. Uh, so, yeah, so, you know, things like that. So, very interestingly, also how um, those uh, masters worked. So, mostly it was obviously women. Uh, however, uh, there's still some uh, unique stuff. Men, pretty often actually, took part in these paintings also. So mostly it was actually young men, unmarried young men, but uh, sometimes, uh, and, and as I said, pretty often actually, a woman, like a craftswoman that was a painter, she would get married, because all of them started from a very young age, so like 12, 14 years old, they started to paint all of this. They were getting married and they would actually teach their family, their husband, sometimes even their mother-in-law, their kids, like basically everyone, their girlfriends, uh, how to paint in this, like, this Patrick Yuka paintings. And uh, it basically became some kind of, you know, um, home business, so you can say. And which is actually very, it, it is actually a very interesting stuff, you know, the fact that the man was taking part in all of this is very unique and very interesting. In the mid 20th century, uh, it actually became also pretty common for men to be uh, masters in Petrikivka paintings. We have now also a lot of men who are uh, masters of this and they are one of the like loud names and important names in, in this uh, in this style. Uh, so yeah, and uh, thus, because you know, there were like whole families uh, like this. The art market in Petrikivka started to develop very fast and uh, just overall, as I understood, Petrikivka market was a very popular place. Uh, so there were people coming there from different regions, not just from Petrikivka or neighboring villages, but overall from the whole Dnipropetrivska region and, uh, as I'm saying, from uh, neighboring also. And uh, in this period of time, they already were painting on paper, so it was very, um, it was very comfortable. It was very convenient because people, you know, now you could uh, uh, change your interior as you know as much as you can. You know, if you had money to buy these paintings, you could have bought a lot of different stuff, and you could have just changed it throughout the year. Uh, how you know how much you wanted so it was very as I said very comfortable and and plus it was comfortable to transport in this so yeah however with the um, onset of the first world war and uh, then of civil war uh, like this revolution in 1917 obviously uh, and collectivization especially, Patrykivka painting declined. Life started to be even harder than, than it was. Um, so yeah, so people lost lost their joy, their faith, maybe, I don't know. But well, basically the, this, the painting started to decline. Not a lot of them were, um, not a lot of them had to desire paint anymore. And plus they just physically didn't have any time to do that. In 1936, then local teacher Alexander Stateva, he contributed to the revival of the folk tradition of Petrikivka uh, painting. And he opened, um, he opened two year 
uh, school. So on the main teacher there was Titiana Pata. I'll be talking about her uh, a bit later. At the end of the video, I'll be telling you about four masters, four women uh, masters that are considered to be, you know, the classical uh, example of uh, Patrykivka, uh, Patrykivka paintings. But uh, now we're here. So Titiana Pata was one of the uh, like the main teacher there and well biggest part of all of the masters uh, of Patrick Yuka painting they were actually her students. In 1936 uh, two exhibition of Ukrainian full art were held uh, it was in Kiev then it got to Moscow uh, where the works of Patrick Yuka uh, crafts uh, women were presented and this was the thing that you know that inspired artists to create again and this is how you know it started to revive a bit this um this um this style and each of the masters uh, they had a unique style right uh however at the same time they were united by certain common features such as for example decorativeness as bright festive colors sophistication of the drawings uh, uh, originality of their drawing and etc etc another very interesting stuff is that uh well we can say that it is kind of like abstract because um women because uh, painters they were not painting you know they this is a very like super stylized uh, um again style to be honest i don't know how to call it right they were not seeking to show everything very neutrally right uh first they marked the main color spots on paper and then they drew the work down to the smallest detail. I will add it here also that, you know, we Ukrainians, we are in this, you know, in the t this uh, team of cultures that are very much connected to the nature, connected to the ground, to the soil, liter literally. And thus, you know, we are finding our inspiration from, like, in all of that. Back then, in villages, it was, you know, especially, you can feel this connection of people with nature. All of the things that uh, these craftswomen were painting, it was their, you know, everyday experience and uh, connection with the nature, but just, like, a bit redone in artistic artistic way. When they were working, they also liked to dip the brush successively into different, so like, into several colors at once. And that's how they were, um, you know, and that allowed their uh, petals and flowers overall to be multicolored. Often they also added birds uh, to their compositions and uh, sometimes animals, sometimes people. And uh, the main goal, as I said, uh, it was not to show everything uh, like as neutral as possible. But the main goal was to embody all the beauty of surrounding world. And there's also, as you said, a lot of different symbols there. So a flower is a symbol of the magnificence of nature, the bounty of fruits and etc. To emphasize this, the artist resorted to strong exaggerations also. Another actually very interesting stuff. So they were not just using brushes and um, just overall the brushes that they were using. It was very interesting because they were using brush with uh, cat uh, hair because at some point they they were like well this is the most comfortable brush to use this is the most uh, this like the best hair uh, because they use they try to use squirrel uh hair they try to use rabbit hair if i'm not mistaken but they stopped with cat's hair uh thus it was you know very very thin and uh, little brushes and uh they were using basically they were using different techniques they were using basically everything so for example uh to paint uh, uh, viburnum they used sticks and they were deep in just one part of the stick in like red paint and they were just like you know pre it was basically you know as you can say they were like printing if they needed like some kind of flower for example uh, just the shape they were cutting they were taking potato cutting this potato into the form of this flower they were again putting this like in paint and then again printing that on the paper and then adding everything like every detail with um the with the brush uh what else interesting uh strawberries for example something like this they were using their fingers i i suppose you know just deep in awesome red paint and also like printing the, their fingers and then adding some details so yeah so it was very interesting well 
folk art as we can say they were using everything that they had in terms of color also uh it's dominated by very bright art a uh, bright color i'm so i'm sorry people were creating uh their i'm sorry people were creating their um painting from the nature also so from different herbs from different fruits um berries uh, flowers and etc etc they were like boiling them in some special way and uh, so for example so the red color was uh, uh, obtained from cherry juice green from wheatgrass and nightshade leaves uh, blue from uh, snowdrop flowers uh, different shades of yellow were uh, created from uh, sunflower petals, onion husks, and the uh, bark of apple sprouts. Then this painting was uh, paints were diluted in egg uh, yolk and milk, and then they were like adding such thing as uh, cherry glue or beet sugar. After the industrialization of all this stuff, obviously the um, fabric paints started to be created and this like neon colors also started to be created like synthetic paint and they started to use this paint and uh, well the most common stuff the uh, pre like after war stuff that they were using is uh, gouache and also watercolor during the years of uh, 1936 uh, to 1944 a lot of craftswomen, a lot of painters, they moved to Kiev and uh, all of them were uh, students of Tatyana Pata and so there were such women as uh, Marfa Dymchenko, Vira Klimenko, uh, Pelagia Hluschenko, Vira Pavlenko and Anna Pavlenko. Da. And, <laughs> and Anna Pavlenko. And, um, so they moved to Kiev and they started to work uh, you know, on this um, uh, industrial use of the Petrikiv painting and they established uh, this um, industrial uh, work so it was created uh, they were working on uh, Shevchenko Kiev uh, souvenir factory and it is here so traditionally a uh, Petrikiv painting is um, done on, like on a paper paper is white right so uh, the background was uh, bright it was white colored but now they started to use black background, so it was not original to Petrikivka painting, but now they started to use the back, the black background. And with like a bit of time, uh, masters in Petrikivka the, uh, itself, they started also to use black, black background. But it is like innovation, as we can say. In 1936, porcelain began to be painted with uh, Petrikivka uh, pattern. And, uh, uh, it started to be like very very popular. So porcelain vases that was uh, hand painted by Marfa Dymchenko uh, were uh, especially popular and were given to um, were given by Soviet official to the heads of different countries, to leaders uh, uh, in different countries. So for example, it was given to Richard Nixon, to Mao Zedong, to Fidel Castro, to Joseph Tito, and etc. etc. In 1961, uh, in Petrikivka, uh, it was opened uh, Petrikivka painting factory that was called Druzhba uh, in English it's friendship and uh, well here uh, the best masters of this uh, style was working and biggest part of them again was students of Tatyana Pata and in late Soviet times uh, about half a thousand people worked there at this factory uh, so uh, they were again creating basically everything different plates different boxes different vases and etc etc and all of this was actually exported into 80 different countries and became a hallmark of ukraine uh, in 2006 this factory however was closed because of bankruptcy in 2011 it was completely destroyed so it, it, it was written that some unknown people just got there and completely destroyed everything so uh, like you know it was like a brief historical background to all of this and now i will end this video with four names uh for women that considered to be the as i said the classical example of petrikivka painting 
and uh, there's not a lot of information about them and uh, just uh, yeah just overall there's not a lot of information online about the Tritivka so this four names that I will be calling it's Tetyana Pata, it's uh, Orena Polipenko, it's Nadia Bilikin and Paraska Pavlenko so uh, we will start with uh, Tetyana Pata uh, don't worry I'll, it won't be very long because as I said there's not a lot of information about of them about them uh, online uh, so yeah so I was not even able to find some books that I can buy because even the, the books do exist I can buy them because they're out of print and I can find them so yeah so it, it's very very sad actually but well uh, with Titana Pata I already mentioned actually to be honest quite a bit of her bi biography that we know so she was uh, um, she considered actually to be the founder of School of Patrykivka painting Petrikiv painting and uh, however she herself always told that uh, I'm actually continuing just the traditions of my grandmother and I mean it is very doubtful that she is the founder of this uh, painting uh, style of the school yes uh, she maybe she considered to be the founder because she developed this uh, school and uh, popularized it so much that and plus as I said biggest part of everyone who is masters in this are actually her students so maybe because of that but uh, yeah but she's definitely not like a founder founder you know of the whole style he started to work from a very young age obviously uh it was starting from 14 14 year old so she started to paint uh, uh, houses and she earned money with that uh, then in 1936 as I said I, it was important year for Tatiana Pata because she was um, she participated in a first Republican exhibition of Ukrainian folk art that was held in Kiev then uh, all of the works were uh, transferred to um, exhibition in Moscow and then she was um, she became a main teacher in this uh, two-year school in Patrykivka. She also was honored a she also was uh, given a title honored master of folk art of the U Ukrainian SSR. We learned also that this school of um, uh, Alexandra Stateva uh, it didn't like last it very long, so it was just uh, it was working just from uh, 1936 to 1941. Uh, overall, so what we can say about Tatiana Spata drawings. So they are light and they are elegant. She was a master of plant compositions to which she sometimes added peacocks, um, like other animals and people also. The artist painted with homemade brushes that were made, as I said, from cat brush, uh, cat's hair, I'm sorry. She also used a brush and mixed paints to obtain the desired color scheme. At the time, masters painted with reeds and fingers and preferred light tones. The artist liked to mix ready-made paints in the process of painting, adding two paints of different colors to the brush. The other women that we are going to be talking is uh, Nadia Bilokin. So the creative output of the craftswoman is divided into two areas, traditional, floral and well, landscape, as we can say, painting, and wedding trains. Her composition on this theme of wedding trains uh, are considered the most outstanding. She started drawing at the age of 12, uh, helping her mother decorate the house with drawing. At 14, she started to make um, make a living with it. After Billy King got married in 1913, she actually taught her husband, so as I said, the family business uh, began. She heard her husband, I think she actually even taught her mother-in-law, she taught her children, he, she taught her girlfriends, one of them was uh, Orisia Polipenko, the next one that we'll be talking, and yeah, and they started to sell it on different uh, fairs in the Dnipropetrovsk region and even in Poltava region. She easily created the plant uh, plants world in her own way, not trying to transfer flowers uh, to paper in a naturalistic way, but finding newer generali generalized forms. Uh, Billy King consciously preserved the traditions of home painting in her works, therefore her works are very decorative, symmetrical, balanced, however pretty static, so there is not a, not a lot of dynamic going on there. The craftswoman products are built on color contrast that uh, she never mixed. Uh, she has a mobile, strong, uniform brush stroke and divides large forms and summarizes small ones. She paints mainly with a small reed, fingers and a small brush also. 
Regarding her wedding trains, the bride and groom uh, and all the guests who went to the wedding were called a train in the Propotorsk region. To be honest, I don't really know why. I, I like I was searching this information. I really didn't understand why is that, but it is like this. So this plot went from a carving and a drawing on the chimney to an easel painting. Over time, this plot acquired historical and symbolic imagery. It became the embodiment of traditional Ukraine, uh, its holiday and its rituals. The next one is Orisa Polipenko, so barely any information about her. So it's Orisa, sometimes you can see that uh, it's uh, Irina Polipenko. So she is another artist uh, that is connected with origins of Patrykiv art. In her words, the simplicity of the decorative ornament is successfully combined with the monumental forms of the main flowers. Uh, her images gravitate towards also static, uh, which are dictated by the architectural form from which the artists have never departed in her paintings and decorative panels. And the last one that we'll be talking today is Paraska Pavlenko. The works of Pavlenko, there is still much in common with, uh, with like old uh, wall paintings. And her works includes uh, a lot of like balanced tonal spots, coordinated color sheens, easy virtuosic drawings and etc. So she applied her brush strokes uh, not densely. A white background always speaks through between them and this brings lazy transparency and lightness to the uh, to Pavlenko's uh, paintings. Most often the craftswoman used five pure aniline paintings, uh, paints, I'm sorry. Uh, it was red, crimson, blue, green and yellow also. A part of that, her daughter's, uh, uh, her daughter, daughter, a part of this, her daughter, da daughter, oh my god, daughter, daughters, daughters, <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, we're also actually pretty famous painters, uh, her daughters was Vera Pavlenko and uh, Helena Pavlenko Chernyshenko, uh, both became as I said, loud names in the Ukrainian art. So yeah, and uh, and 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 to end this video, I would just say that uh, Petrikivka painting is um, one of the main assets of the uh, intangible culture of Ukraine. And even in 2013, we were able to uh, include uh, this um, uh, this painting. Uh, this Petrikivka painting into UNESCO list of, inten of intangible culture heritage of humanity. So yeah, so this is everything that I have for today. I think it will be, well, maybe short, I don't know, maybe not. Uh, but yeah, but it's not a lot of information to be honest, because there is like not a lot of information in access, because uh, as I said, uh, even though if you can find some kind of books on this topic, uh, you are not you won't be able to buy it because they are well biggest part of them are actually you know those are old uh soviet books soviet research uh, researches and uh, yeah and they are obviously out of stock they are out of printing and this is overall to be honest a problem a very big problem with ukrainian art that uh there is I mean, I also, I do understand that obviously you will not print like dozens of thousands of books if you know that not a lot of people will buy them and, you know, they will be just lying like around somewhere in the, in the typography or how to say it right. I do understand that, but still, you know, there's such a biggest part of all of these art books are printed with the, with it just like you know just thousands of copies thousand just one thousand of copy and that's all uh, for the whole soviet union mind you the whole soviet union not just like ukraine or uh other you know countries uh, post-soviet countries it's just for the whole of soviet union thousands of stuff so yeah so obviously it's very very rare to find good books um and if they are printed with a good amount of number they are so expensive <laughs> That, you know, you, you, like, most of the time you just cannot allow yourself to buy them because they, they're too expensive. Uh, so, yes, so it, a brief information about this. I, I hope, to be honest, that at the end of the world, a lot of you would, you know, consider to come here. Well, at least in Western, you know, regions, in the central regions, because, 
yeah. Uh, and you would see that uh, in a lot of these uh, different souvenir shops that um, and different stuff, different items with this particular painting. Yeah, so you so you would see there is, I mean, in, in such a souvenir shops, obviously they are not uh, like handmade. Well, in some of them maybe, uh, and it will be way more expensive, obviously, than uh, manufactured one, but the biggest part of the production is manufactured. So, yeah, but it's, it's still, it's very interesting. I think it's a very nice thing to bring home <laughs> uh, after the travel. So, yeah, so, um, yeah, so I will stop here. Uh, I have no idea, to be honest, what will be the next video. <laughs> I think, I, I think that I will uh, maybe finally tell you about my diploma because I, I i considered to make this one of the themes but i i don't know why i'm pushing it away because i uh well i mean my diploma my final paper for my bachelor degree uh, in art history because uh, i was writing about uh, women scribes in medieval ages uh, in western europe so found actually a lot of very interesting information have a lot of a lot of different interesting suggestions suggestions in terms of books uh so maybe the next time i will be talking about that but yeah but for today it's all and that's everything and yeah hope to see you in the next video and hope that it was interesting for you and i'm more than sure that it was a completely new thing you most definitely never heard about this uh, before uh, so yeah, so stay safe, uh, stay safe, uh, what else? Wish you all the best overall, <laughs> wish you all the best and hope to see you in the next videos. Bye bye.